Hey, hey, hey guys! This is the second part of my Berlin trip. Here's what you missed in part one. But after Napoleon's defeat of 1814, the Prussians brought it back and restored it to Berlin. <laughs> or even sit in the rotating restaurant and enjoy a meal. If you've not watched part one, there's a link appearing for that right now. In this episode, we're briefly going to investigate together how the German Democratic Republic was repressed by the Stasi. We're going to visit the very center of repression in the GDR, the Stasi headquarters in Berlin. We'll go to the very offices of the head of the Stasi, Eric Milke, before what I'm proud to say is a rare opportunity to see shut off areas of Hohenschönhausen prison, which was a Stasi remand prison and was so secret in the German Democratic Republic at the time that it was left off all the maps. So let's get on with this week's episode. So this is the headquarters of the Stasi. Yeah, not a great organisation, the Stasi. East Germany was one of the most surveilled countries in the world. We get some tickets now and see what's up. Let's have a very quick look about how the German Democratic Republic came about and why the Stasi was seen by the ruling SED party as instrumental at retaining power for the party within the country. Following the Yalta and Potsdam conferences of 1945 and the end of World War II, Germany was divided largely into two main zones. East Germany was under the jurisdiction of the Soviets and West Germany was largely under the jurisdictions of the British, American and French. In 1949, these two main zones effectively became two countries the Federal Republic of Germany in the West and the German Democratic Republic in the East, each with their own political parties, economic systems and laws. You'll notice that areas of Berlin were still under Allied control throughout this whole period. These areas were effectively sealed off from the rest of East Germany after 1961 with the erection of the Berlin Wall. You might think that the GDR was a democratic country with different political parties that the population can vote on. In fact, it was a one-party state under the control of the SED. The Socialist Unity Party, or the SED, was founded under Walter Ubricht and for a large part of its history was run by Erich Honecker. The Stasi was founded on the 8th of February 1950. There were lots of people in East Germany who were unhappy for many reasons and the Ministry for State Security, otherwise known as the Stasi, was used for spying on the population and fighting any opposition to the government by overt and covert measures. By far the person who is most synonymous with the Stasi is Erich Milke. His tenure as head of the Stasi lasted from 1957 until 1989. And we are about to go to his flat and personal offices at the Stasi headquarters in Berlin. <laughs> But before we go there, I thought it might be a good idea for you to know why I'm so interested in the Stasi. I think the biggest thing for me is the way they got into the public psyche, the way they made themselves part of the fabric of the German Democratic Republic is fascinating. It's also terrifying. It has been described as one of the most effective and repressive police intelligence systems in history. At one point it was thought to have employed 274,000 people. After the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Stasi, they found 174,000 unofficial informers. That's people in the public like you and me informing on our boss or informing on our family. Informing on our family guys, that's pretty crazy. And that accounts for about 2.5% of the whole population of the country. But that's not all. In the final days of the Stasi, when everything was being destroyed before anyone could find out what had happened, all these bits of paper were being shredded. And as we speak today, records and pieces of paper are still being put together by a team of people in Germany. Some estimates say that once this is done, we could have as many as 500,000 informers. Before we go back to Berlin though, I'd like to describe something that the Stasi did when they found out about someone, when they found out maybe about an opponent of the party. And it's this thing called Zazetsung. I think I've said it right, my German's not great. The meaning of this is just a dark thing. It means literally decomposition. So say they targeted me for maybe wanting to leave the country having like overt sympathies for the West or something like that, I would then be pinpointed for decomposition. I might find things happen like the police would turn up and interview my boss about me. Not about anything in particular, but they'd just do that and then leave work. I might notice that suddenly someone was really obviously taking photos of me in the street. Suddenly I might 
might be given a new car or a nice flat or something. Out of completely nowhere, my groups of friends would start to think, hold on, is this guy a Stasi informant? They tried to isolate you. But not only that, I might find that my alarm would go off at five in the morning rather than at seven in the morning. I might find that clothes had been moved from certain drawers to other drawers in my bedroom, that pictures had been taken off the wall and moved around the house. These sorts of things I'd hope that I might say to my friends, what is going on? I think I'm going mad. It was all about isolating you and effectively neutralizing you as a political force within your friends group. My flat might be bugged, my car's tires might be slashed. In some cases, sexual aids like vibrators would be sent to people's wives or husbands. It's hard to comprehend how far the Stasi would go without physically hurting you. And a lot of the time, victims would have no idea that it was the Stasi that were doing it and consequently mental breakdowns and suicides would result. I found the Stasi Museum and the Erich Milka offices absolutely fascinating. The basement in the building held some of the 5.4 million index cards that held information about the population. We were shown around by our helpful guide into Erich Milka's offices themselves. It was strange to look into his personal flat and small bed that he slept in when he had to work late hours. It was sobering to think that we were standing in the room that used to be the nucleus of the Stasi, resplendent with the same wood panelling and the same furniture that had been there 30 years ago. So this is Eric Milka's office. So that was interesting. This is a bleak place, isn't it? Like the architecture is so bleak, really weird. The only bit that's open for us to go into is that little bit there. It's a huge building, isn't it? In 1990, so a year after the wall came down and all these buildings around us, you can see at the moment, were full of information about the population. And the population knew this, and they weren't very happy. So they stormed this building in 1990. They all turned up here, like loads and loads of people, thousands of people turned up here. They got into this building, they found the files. Stars were actually still in existence after 1989, and they were still here in 1990. They tried to destroy the files as quickly as they could by shredding them, pouring coffee on them, they'd put them in like, you know, try and get water on them, just destroy them in any way. Yeah, look, look at these piles of shredded paper here, look. Shredded paper. It's crazy, isn't it? But the people effectively got in here, took back control of their own information. They weren't going to be surveilled on anymore, they were fed up with it. They did not want a faceless power based in these offices to have information on them that had been gathered by, you know, their friends informing on them, phone wiretaps, photographs, things like that being taken. And so they came here in 1992 to, to, to make sure they got that back. So we've seen how the GDR came about, we've seen what the SED party was, we've also briefly looked over the Stasi, the amount of informants they had, how people were spied on and also see how people's lives were decomposed in front of their eyes with this zazexen or decomposition procedure. Now we're going to have a brief look at where you might go if you were actually arrested by the Stasi, how that would happen and where you'd be taken. If you were taken off the street you would be put in one of the Stasi secret prison vans. These were often disguised as bakers vans or florists vans and could have up to six miniature cells in them. Not being able to see outside you'd then often be driven around and around for three to four hours hours, by which time you'd be so disorientated you wouldn't even know if you were in the same city, at a Baltic port or even in another country. For some, their final destination would be Hodenschonhausen prison in Berlin. Honschonhausen was the headquarters for the 17 Stasi Roman prisons that were located around East Germany. In May 1945, the red brick building was confiscated by the Soviet occupation forces and transformed into Special Camp No. 3. Prisoners were put to work to construct a system of subterranean bunker-like cells in the basement of the former canteen, known as the U-boat, or submarine. The damp cold cells were equipped with wooden beds and a bucket serving as a lavatory. A light bulb was burning 24 hours a day, so prisoners didn't know what time of day 
it was. Interrogations were usually held at night in an atmosphere of physical and psychological violence. The living conditions in the camp were lethal. Food was scarce and hygiene impossible, and an increasing number of political enemies of the Soviet occupation forces disappeared in the camp. After the founding of the GDR, the jurisdiction of the prison came under the control of the Stasi. Its main use from then on was to be an administrative centre for the prison complex, and also as a tool for political repression in the GDR. Once inside the prison, and after the usual cavity search and the changeover to prison clothing, Inmates were deliberately left for weeks before they were interrogated. Indeed, some say they even looked forward to interrogation because it was the only human contact they'd get. There were intricate systems in place to make sure that prisoners never accidentally came across any of the other inmates or had any interaction with them whatsoever. For the duration of a prisoner's incarceration, the guards were only allowed to say three things to them. Andre Kokish, our guide, explained. Because isolation was normally the, um, the rule here. Yeah. They have been isolated. So the only person they'd speak to would be the guard and their interrogator? Yeah, the interrogator, because the guard didn't speak to them. They just had three orders. Come, go, or face the wall. Really? Yes. And so presumably it was all just primarily political? Oh, yeah. political. Yeah. Everything the Stasi considered political. During this time, the Stasi would collect scent samples from the prisoners to be used by dogs in the event of an escape or if in the future the Stasi needed to find the inmate if they'd been released. Once the interrogators were ready, prisoners were called to the interrogation wing. This was when a traffic light system in the ceiling was used in conjunction with special markings on the corridor floor that are still there today to prevent prisoners from seeing each other. Yeah. Um, so if we, were, if we were coming down this way with a prisoner, we would switch this light on. If you had this, so um, you would come from here because that's green and uh, on this side it would be red. Okay. So, um, if a guard was escorting a prisoner down the corridor and saw the red light come on in the ceiling, they would use a series of tape markers in the floor to make the prisoner face the wall and therefore avoid contact with any other prisoners. Interrogations were carried out in one of the many soundproof cells in the interrogation wing. Interrogations could last day and night and were designed to wear the prisoner down in the hope that they'd tell the Stasi names, inform them of more clandestine activity and prepare them for trial. The guards never carried weapons for fear that the inmates could possibly grab a gun off them and do themselves or the guards harm. Andre explained the alarm system. And then this was the uh, uh, signal wire if there was a problem. Yes. They could pull that and that would break yeah. it. So it's, and then there was a, an alarm, not here, but uh, in a special room. And then um, Stasi guards with guns came because the, the, the guards were transported into an interrogation, he didn't have a gun. This alarm system was even in place for patients of the prison hospital. Uh, in, the, in the prison uh, hospital, this alarm would be here, in this room. Okay. And they built, uh, you know... So these this, lights would come on with that? Yes, ex exactly at the same spot. Uh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Andre left us briefly and walked down the corridor. I had no idea he was about to test to see if the alarm still worked. Oh yeah! It truly was an eerie moment, transported back in time to the noises of repression. Oh yeah! Hon Schonhausen was the only prison to have its own hospital in the whole prison service of the GDR. That meant inmates who were pregnant, anyone who fell ill while they were in prison, anyone who was injured during arrest or perhaps shot whilst trying to escape, would all come to the hospital at Hon Schonhausen. So what would this be? Would this be for so for food, food or? and medication? Food and, uh, medication. Yeah. They are bigger because um, beds. Of, because of the bed yeah. and uh, the table for the interrogation. The interrogation took place inside. This ah, right. So, so, so they interrogate them while they were ill in there. Yes. And the uh, interrogation officer decided will he be interrogated or operated first. Ah, right. So and not the doctor. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you don't tell us what we want to know, we're going to withhold treatment. Yeah. Okay.
It's important to remember that the remit of the Stasi agent doctors who worked on the patients in Hoddenschonhausen's hospital was to make the inmates well enough for trial. They also interrogated inmates in their hospital beds and could withhold treatment as a method of intimidation. In 1992, the prison complex was listed as a historical monument, and since 1994, 5.4 million people, many of them youngsters, have visited the memorial. Most of the memorial's guided tours are conducted by former inmates. I asked Andre before we left whether any former inmates ever visited the prison and made themselves known. Oh yes, he replied, but most of them don't realise that the prison they're about to visit was actually the one that they were incarcerated in all those years ago. Such was the secrecy and disorientation surrounding arrest and release in those times. I hope you've enjoyed my short video about the GDR and in particular about Hohenschonhausen prison. There's so much history and so much more to see at this fantastic museum that everyone who's interested in this period of history should make the utmost effort to go and visit. I cannot thank the team at Hohenschonhausen prison enough for making us feel so welcome and allowing us to see parts of the prison that are usually closed off to the public. If you're ever in Berlin and have a day to spare, then I'd highly recommend you visit this fantastic memorial. Guys, please hit that subscribe button, please like and please comment on the video below. It means a great deal to me to find out what you guys think about these videos and also of any inaccuracies that you may perceive. Also, if you get a sec, please click the link to our latest video. I'll see you next week, everybody. Stay safe.